Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. We're going to start out in sports tonight. We're going to start with Jim Landis, who died recently at the age of 83. Jim Landis was a favorite of mine when I was a kid. He was the center fielder on the 1959 Chicago White Sox. Wasn't much of a hitter. For a while, I actually patterned my swing after him. That's maybe why I wasn't so much of a hitter. But he could really play center field. He was among the best. People compared him defensively to Willie Mays. He could roam to left center. He could roam to right center. And he could go back to the center field fence and take away home runs like nobody's business. During his career, he won five Golden Gloves in center field. With Nellie Fox at second and Louis Aparicio at short, and Landis in center field, the White Sox embodied that adage. You have to be strong defensively up the middle. And that's how they won the 1959 American League pennant. They were the only team in the American League to take the pennant from the Yankees in the 10-year period from 1955 to 1964. The White Sox didn't have a good history. They won the World Series in 1917. They threw the World Series in 1919. And they didn't win the World Series again until 2005. So winning the pennant in 1959 made it a stellar year for the White Sox, even though they lost to the Dodgers in the World Series. But they had good old number one, Jim Landis, picking it out in center field. As a final tribute to Jim Landis, let's play a little bit of Captain Stubby and the Buccaneers playing Let's Go, 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 White Sox, their theme song for 1959. Let's go, 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 White Sox. We're with you all the way. Yeah, that song and Jim Landis should bring back some memories for White Sox fans of a certain age. We're going to move on now to our feature, Y.A. Tittle, who died recently at the age of 90. Y.A. Tittle came out of Marshall, Texas, went to LSU, and became one of the great quarterbacks in 49er history. He'd throw the alley-oop to R.C. Owens, whose podcast we've done, but he really gained his name as one of the New York Giants in the early 1960s when the Giants won three Eastern Conference titles in a row, 61, 62, 63, largely on the strength of his arm. Unfortunately, they lost all three championship games, twice to great Packer teams and once to a great Bear team. But it was no fault of Y.A. Tittle. Here's a report on the career of Yelverton Abraham Tittle Jr. Y.A. Tittle never won an NFL championship, but over the course of a 17-year career, he did just about everything else. Born Yelverton Abraham Tittle in 1926, Y.A. would go on to become one of the most tenacious quarterbacks in history. Tittle grew up in Texas and played football at LSU, where he was MVP of the 1947 Cotton Bowl. After a brief stint with the Colts, Tittle joined the San Francisco 49ers in 1951. He would remain with the club for 10 seasons, six of which he would serve as the team's primary starter. Before Hail Mary became part of football vocabulary, fans got to know Tittle's famed alley-oop. I never thought as a quarterback I'd ever resort to throwing an end-over-end lob lolly pass straight up in the air, but that's what the alley-oop pass was. Again, Owens flanked to the right. This has got to be the alley-oop. There's no time for anything else. Tittle throws. Owens is double team. He's going downfield. He'll go and he goes up. He's got In 1961, the New York Giants traded for the then 34-year-old. Tittle and the Giants reached the NFL championship game in each of the quarterback's first three seasons with the club. His 36 touchdown passes in 1963 set an NFL record that stood for over 20 years. Tittle's seven touchdown pass game against the Redskins in 1962 is still tied for the NFL record. Perhaps the most timeless image of Tittle came in 1964 when the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette captured him kneeling after throwing an interception and taking a vicious hit. The photo is regarded as one of the most iconic images in sports journalism and highlights the kind of doggedness that made Tittle such a memorable player. He would retire at the end of that season. After a 17-year career, Tittle was elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1971, and his number 14 was retired by the Giants. We had never won a world championship that I so much wanted, but I really will settle to this. 
this, this is really the height of all of my dreams. Well, the 1963 NFL championship game at Wrigley Field was a classic where the Bears beat the Giants 14-10. to 10. We talked about it when we did the Bill Wade podcast. It was really cold that day. I couldn't go, but my dad went. Tittle was picked off five times. But more importantly, his daughter, Diane Tittle Dillette, wrote a great book about it called Giants and Heroes, and she talks about it here. It's quite poignant. I.A. Tittle was the first quarterback elected to the Hall of Fame who did not win a championship. He spent 10 seasons in San Francisco and finished his career playing four years with the New York Giants. While he was forever chasing a championship, his daughter, Diane, was fascinated not with football, but with poetry. As Diane grew, she associated her passion for poetry with her father's passion for football, thanks to an ancient Greek named Pindar. The victory odes of Pindar celebrate the moment of victory um, in the life of an athletic hero. The only Pindar that I ever uh, knew was a linebacker with the Green Bay Packers. Pindar saw in the moment of victory a kind of transcendence briefly making radiant a dark and brutal world. And that's when the memory of the 1963 championship between the New York Giants and the Chicago Bears came back to me. And that's when I began my book. After reading all this, I got to thinking, is this, if this is my daughter, I think my real daughter might be in South Carolina on a cotton field someplace because we might have got the wrong daughter in the hospital. Let's face it, I mean, no one has written a victory ode in 2,000 years. I really didn't know how to go or what balance to strike exactly. Diane called her victory ode Giants and Heroes, which was ironic because as a young girl, she didn't see her father as a giant or a hero. As I watched my father play, the hardest thing for me was always one little unsettling word, hero. So I guess where most kids have a feeling that their fathers are 10 feet tall, I knew that my father was no bigger than my thumb at least two hours every week on a Sunday afternoon, and I worried about him a lot. I didn't see him as invincible. I knew that he was just a mere mortal. In some ways, that's how I think of my father. A fallen warrior, but he's not flat out. He's getting up again. He's going to come back, come back for more. Reading Diane's book, I realized that I was sort of like the Greek that she's portraying that was in the struggle for excellence. And I always was struggling for excellence. I didn't know I was a great warrior until I read Diane's book, I guess. <laughs> he always was a warrior, but his last chance to be a champion came in the 1963 title game against George Hallis's Chicago Bears. I tried to forget the Chicago Bear game, and she keeps writing about it. Helmet scratching the frozen ground, breath billowing, Chicago. As Tittle released the ball late in the second quarter at Wrigley Field, his leg fluttered like a moth and the knee tore loose. Dante's Inferno was a birthday party compared to what was happening in the end zone when my father was injured. People were cheering an injury, and that was something I, I wasn't accustomed to. You know, the, I was accustomed to the Giants winning. You know, we had lived the football fairy tale for three years. For three years, ever since Tittle had shown up at the giant camp, too old to be taken seriously with his tattered body, his old-fashioned high tops, and his little boy pads, he had listened to the siren song. They had been picked for last, this team of old giants. But with Tittle at the helm, they set out to find the Golden Fleece and came up with three division championships in a row. Three championships, no title. And still the siren singing, singing of broken bones and all the years. Tittle refused to let his injury keep him sidelined. Deliberately, he put body back into a cold soul and felt the wind on his face. Putting aside the fury, the anger, the nerves, he became alert, as if to find that boy inside himself who remembered the way home and who would help him stand and walk and play the game again. In the end, Tittle threw five interceptions and lost his third straight championship. It was as if the whole dream began to unravel. There is a pass. It happened during the fourth quarter just as Tittle went down. He released the ball and drew a picture of his lifetime with the pass. My father considers it the worst game of his career, and I consider it his best. And out of all my years as a spectator, Chicago is the game I find most worth remembering. It was sort of a horrifying heroism. The violence made sense. The violence was practical. But what wasn't practical was the fact that one would spend years and years of one's life in exchange for a moment. But that was the beauty, that he would do that. 
I missed out on that one moment of, of excellence, that one desire, that one thing that, that you seek. And that's the ring on your finger. Sounds silly, doesn't it? All the sacrifice of getting to the championship game was worth every minute, every second, every play. After the game, I remember I ran up to him to tell him that he was the champion. And he sort of, he looked at me and as if I was the nice, his nice little girl who was trying to make him feel better. But I wasn't trying to make him feel better. That was the truth. He really was the champion to me. He was the champion in my soul. My daughter looking back at her father, not knowing that he was a hero, and then now realizing that he was a hero. And that sort of thrills me. As I watch that game, maybe when he reads my book, he'll see that, that he didn't get the wrong baby at the hospital. And they said, very poignant. Well, we're going to move out of sports now and into show business with Bob Schiller, who died recently at the age of 98. One of the great comedy writers of the television era. He wrote for Maud. He wrote for All in the Family. But his greatest work was with his partner, Bob Weisskopf, writing for Lucille Ball in I Love Lucy. In fact, that partnership was involved in some of the greatest episodes of I Love Lucy, including the John Wayne episode, where Lucy kept breaking John Wayne's Groman Chinese Theater footprint. They wrote the Stopping the Grapes episode. They wrote the Superman episode with George Reeves. Here's a little bit of Bob Weisskopf and Bob Schiller talking about their work for I Love Lucy. And one day I opened the window and I said, uh, do you want to jump first or do you want me to jump first? And I looked out the window and there was Jess Oppenheimer, his ex-roommate, who was then the producer of I Love Lucy, and he saw us. Bob had uh, roomed with Jess, and Jess remembered Bob. And he says, I was just thinking of you guys. He says, uh, I'm going to put on a team on I Love Lucy. How would you like to do that? Now, how far into the run was I Love Lucy when you joined? I think it was the fourth year or the fifth year. Fourth year, yeah. How familiar were you with the show? Fairly familiar. Everybody was. Everybody is. I mean, who doesn't know Lucy? You know, the sun never sets on a Lucy show. It's like the British Empire. I always marvel at the fact that Jess and Bob Carroll and Madeline, then Madeline Pugh, did every show every week for four years without any help. Eventually they got needed help, and uh, fortunately the rest, as they say, is uh, hysterical. When was the first time you met Lucille Ball? The first week that we worked there... Jess said, come on down to the run-through. When you see what Lucy does with your material, she'll make you think you're a writer. <laughs> yeah, that was a wonderful line, Jess said. She'll make you think you're a writer. Because when she did it, you say, Jesus, that's the way I meant it to be when I wrote it. Oftentimes it was a lot better than the way we yeah. had it. You start with saying she was the most brilliant comedian we've ever had. And there's no comedian who's ever approached her talent. And so consequently, uh, anything she did was pretty funny and she was never embarrassing she she always knew her lines she was a, a taskmaster and particularly of herself she uh, rehearsed a lot more than anybody else because she wanted to get it perfect almost down to the, how many eyes blinks she would have you know just remarkable her concentration and she was always feminine she was never masculine i mean which is uh, the problem with most female uh, comedians they become tend to become masculine here they are discussing the famous grape stomping episode. Well, it's not a, not a brilliant uh, job of writing, you know. That was really her acting. Yeah. I wish it were a better job. There was much more writing, by the way. We had little moves in, in the grape vat but that were taken out because they were too small. You, you couldn't see. For example, she dropped her earring and tried to get the earrings and got a bunch of grapes instead. So that went out because of the fact that you... you know, you know, you shoot the show at a broad angle. You couldn't see what she was doing. Minor point. She was brilliant. She made you look like a writer. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Taps. And we're going to close with a brief mention of Jimmy Beaumont, who died recently at the age of 76. He was the lead singer for the Pittsburgh doo group, The Skyliners. They were a late 50s one-hit wonder, but it was a huge hit. In December 1958, it was number one on Cashbox and number three on Billboard. And since then, it's been covered by everybody from Ronnie Millsap to Guns N' Roses. It's one of the best-known songs of the early rock era, and here's the original and best, I might add, with Jimmy Beaumont at the lead, or Since I Don't Have You. I don't have plans and Anything. Since 
inside done. 